Hello and welcome to Sideline. Today we'll be talking to Ms. Adjadagal Tsakhtsakhan, founder and director of Breathe Mongolia Clean Air Coalition. So Adjadagal is connecting with us on Zoom from the United States. Adza, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, Hope you're staying warm and safe. It's a pleasure to have you. Uh, Breath Mongolia is an organ uh, is a nonprofit organization that works to eradicate the air pollution levels in Mongolia. So many of our viewers may remember the photo of you holding up a sign in Times Square uh, that read Mongolia is suffocating. So could you please tell us why you decided to make that statement back then and also how Breath Mongolia NGO emerged from that moment? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I was born and raised in Mongolia and spent quite a bit of time studying and working abroad. And at the time I was uh, living in New York City working. And in that particular year, um, quite a few of my family members were hospitalized, which is very abnormal. Um, and they were hospitalized due to pneumonia. And then one of our um, colleagues, from our group that promotes Mongolian culture, she started writing about air pollution as a UB Post journalist. And that's when I first learned about how bad air, how bad air pollution is. And especially when my family was getting hospitalized and my dad was uh, battling cancer uh, with metastasis in his lungs and all that, I truly started paying attention to what's happening and kept uh, learning about it. So the more I learned about the health impact of air pollution and how dangerous and serious the conditions are in Mongolia, I was extremely alarmed and I had to do something even from New York City. So the protest at Times Square, uh, we did a live video. It was like a very peaceful, we barely talked. We just um, held signs about what's going on and it caught quite a bit of attention even from um, people who don't know anything about the country. And we decided to continue raising awareness through a Facebook page and eventually in when I was traveling in San Francisco, I met uh, Oyinga Gambatar. She's a geoscientist and a um, software engineer as well. So she was extremely passionate about it and she wanted to dedicate her technical skills to take action as well. So uh, with our colleague from our other group, the environmental scientist and the journalist, uh, currently she's um, a green financing specialist and also air purifier uh, entrepreneur, Ayuka Ayungirish Mukhut. Uh, we three of us, we decided to register a nonprofit organization in the US. And later on we registered it uh, another nonprofit in Mongolia under the name Agarin Harush. And the reason why we decided to register a nonprofit organization is that we wanted to operate with more uh, efficiency. Uh, we wanted to recruit people to work part time or full time on different projects. And uh, we just didn't want to do, uh, you know, sit behind the computer and complain on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Uh, Breath Mongolia is run by uh, global citizens in 10 different countries. So what countries are there? And also, could you please tell us how you found and met with those uh, members of your team? Sure. Um, currently, we have volunteers from about 10 countries and four continents. And half of them are in Mongolia, around 40 to 50 active volunteers. And half of them are in Mongolia. The mm -hmm. other half are... Mm -hmm in different countries around the world. Most of them are mm -hmm. Mongolians. Uh, sometimes they've immigrated to the country as children or sometimes they're, they're currently just international students or expats. And uh, we have few members who've never been to Mongolia. For example, my colleague, um, IBMer Kaushik, he's in India. We have a Ukrainian project manager who lives in Canada. She hasn't been to Mongolia. And then we also had a software engineer in Kenya. And the way we met each other is mainly through social media. So people reach out to our social media channels, expressing interest in working together, or sometimes we meet in person, sometimes through referrals. And the key is whenever people find out how dire the situation is in Mongolia, they get extremely alarmed and worried 
and they want to be part of the solution. So uh, how is it like to manage uh, people that are working in many different countries and also how is it like to work with them online? Yeah, it definitely has its challenges, right? And now that the entire world became uh, digital and everyone's working remotely, we didn't really have that transition. Uh, from, most, from almost the beginning of time, we've been working remotely in different uh, time zones. So uh, managing time zones, for example, if a team member is in San Francisco and we have a meeting with people in Mongolia at 16 hours difference. So time zone is obviously a challenge. And then also we are, our challenge is that we don't get to meet each other in person as much. Uh, I've met most of them in person, but there are plenty of members whom I haven't met in person and most of them haven't met each other. But I think uh, regardless of, of the challenges, I think we've done a pretty good job thanks to technology and internet and sheer willingness of people to work with strangers because we have a common goal. It's great to hear that you have found the right people to fight against air pollution with. Uh, however, uh, many people in uh, many people from other countries, also even the Mongolian uh, Mongolians, are unaware of how serious the air pollution problem uh, is actually in Mongolia. So, how would you assess uh, the current air quality conditions in Mongolia? And also, what do you wish the other people would know? Yeah, sure. It's obviously a very complex topic. Let's remember that air pollution mm -hmm. is not only just outdoor and ambient air, right? Uh, what we see and breathe outside, but it's also what we breathe inside. We have all kinds of uh, sources of pollutants indoors as well. Mm -hmm. And secondly, when we think about air quality in Mongolia, we need to literally think about the entire country because when we talk about air quality, we mostly talk about UV, but lately, you know, more and more people are also recognizing that air quality is an issue outside of UV. It's everywhere. Wherever we're burning fossil fuel, wherever we're driving old cars, wherever we're using boilers, there is air quality issue. So that's one thing I want to remind before I talk about, <laughs> before I make my own <laughs> assessment. Um, so when it comes to um, the current conditions of air quality, um, if we look at IQ air uh, world ranking, in 2014, we were number three in the world. And in 2020, we were number four, right next to India, Pakistan, and other countries with billion and millions of people. And we have only 3 million people. We have only few cities. And it's quite tragic that air quality is as bad or worse than these cities and countries with billions and millions of people. So that's one point. Um, secondly, if we just talk about UV, um, we have some government reports that particulate matter, which uh, fine particulate matter PM 2.5, which is one of the quite a few pollutants, six, seven main pollutants, it decreased on an annual basis, but a recent report that was shown during a high level parliament discussion, when we look at the cold season data, um, which means, you know, from September, October till April, that particular level didn't really change much. It went down by like five, 6%. And when we look at other pollutants such as sulfur dioxide, it went up dramatically. You know, when I looked at it last time, um, it was like 200% higher than the previous year. And secondly, we gotta, if we really want to claim that things are better, we gotta have access to data or free and open access to data to validate and conduct independent research and independent analysis, right? Last time I spoke to different stakeholders about open air quality data during a workshop, um, one research institute had to pay 8 million tugriks to access about six years of data. So accessibility to data 
uh, and the ability to make our own analysis to validate such claims or to assess the current situation um, is challenging. So I think if we improve our access to um, data, if the government makes it free and open, I think we'll have more confidence in saying things are better. And the other variable that we need to pay attention is the health conditions of our population, right? So if people keep having lung cancers, if people keep having strokes, and if child mortality is high, and if miscarriages are you know, four times higher in the cold season, can we really say that the, that the conditions have uh, improved? We cannot. Yeah, we cannot, exactly. So uh, thanks to the air pollution map of Mongolia that you created, uh, people can also look at their air uh, quality, current air quality index from where they are on the Breath Mongolia org website of yours. And could you please elaborate on making the air pollution map of, uh, of Mongolia? Did you put all those sensors uh, by yourself? And also, what other digital tools are you going to create? Yeah, so our breathemongolia.org website or platform is a bilingual website where anyone can access access it from anywhere, from their phone or tablet or you know computer to see live or the latest air quality data of the entire country. There is no other map that shows the entire country's air quality with as many as sensor data as possible. So when it comes to sensors, we don't own uh, any sensors or devices ourselves. We did not set up the network ourselves. We are accessing existing network that other people have set up. So for example, our map has you know, data from government stations or US embassy where the APIs and the codes are available. And then we have uh, data, we're showing data from air, IQ air or air visual low cost sensors. And then we're showing data from Purple Air. That's another private company that sells devices. And those devices have been installed throughout the country and provinces, and then quite a few in UB. So whenever our goal is that whenever a sensor device is installed, whether it's a low cost sensor or reference grade research uh, sensor device or station, we work on accessing the APIs and the codes so that everyone in Mongolia can access that air quality. So the more devices there are, uh, the more coverage we'll have. So if you have, if anybody has their own devices and want to share their data and make it available to their neighbors, so they don't have to spend $200, $300 to know what kind of air they're breathing, uh, just let us know, we'll add it to our map and everyone can have access and know what mm -hmm. to do. Yeah, it's really admirable. Uh, what you're doing, what you've been doing in order to fight the situation to improve the, the conditions in Mongolia. And how many years would you say it would take to improve uh, the air, air pollution uh, issue in Mongolia significantly until the point that we are able to breathe a healthy or at least moderate quality air? So there's, that, um, there's not one uh, answer and I wouldn't say I have all the answers. And everyone, according to their sector expertise, have different solutions that they're working on already. And um, when I discussed, you know, with my team, approximately, you know, uh, optimistically, how long it could it can take if we really work together well, it can take about a decade. It 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 can uh, if if we're optimistic, and. Um, and I am optimistic because we really don't have choice. You know, Mongolians don't live long. Only three to 4% of our population lives about 65. So when it comes to bold actions, right? Some of the things that we really need to focus on is energy efficiency. So when it comes to our, you know, big and small constructions, um, ener ener building energy efficient, Housing, minimizing our energy and heat loss is a key to solving this problem. So some organizations like GitHub, right, they're working on improving the technology to minimize energy loss. So that gears and houses and gear district in the countryside, um, they use 
the least amount of electricity or they use the least amount of coal. And the other one is awareness and education. We still don't have enough human resource capacity uh, on decision-making level and implementation level and even on the public education level too. So um, there's, there is a plan that was proposed that uh, to the Ministry of Environment to you know, conduct this major public awareness and education about air pollution, but it hasn't been implemented yet. So people like us <laughs> are trying to do it. You know, We are building this very comprehensive resource on what people can do on the ground when it comes to reducing their car emissions, reducing, you know, protecting or wearing masks or using the right air purifiers. We're building all of that. And then all that information needs to be disseminated through, through different channels across the country. So quite a bit of public awareness and education work needs to be done. And then um, when it comes to air pollution, it's also a poverty issue, right? Um, if our people can't afford an apartment, they'll have to build a gear. If they can't job, find if they can't find a job, they'll have to move into a city center and um, burn coal, and or they'll have to buy old cars. So the entire economy needs to improve, and I don't have answers to that one. But even if our common economy improves we need to invest back in education and invest back in public health. And one of our members suggested that there should be independent advisory board to the national committee so that, you know, people who are making decisions are educated and guided by scientists and engineers because it's an urban planning uh, problem as well, right? Housing and urban planning and city planning and all that. And obviously with political will, the prime minister or the president, they need to take the lead, get in more and more involved until this issue is gone, you know? Uh, you can't just pay attention to one year and forget about it the next. Yeah, absolutely. So our time is unfortunately coming to an end soon. So could you share us what Brit Mongolia have planned for the year 2022? And also concluding our talk, what else would you like to say to our audience? Thank you so much for inviting me to um, talk about air pollution uh, issue that's extremely important to every one of us. And um, in the coming year in 2022, we will uh, continue our operations in the three areas that we set out. So the first area is, you know, providing education and building awareness. And secondly, we are all about collaborating uh, in fostering collaboration. So we built this uh, platform, Agarnik, where all the latest news, all the latest articles, the research studies and reports on Mongolian air quality and climate change are available. You're welcome to uh, check out the platform or even join as a member and upload your own research and study and reports too, so that we all have the same information and we don't duplicate our efforts and waste resources. The other, the third area of our operations is um, watchdog activities, right? So monitoring the progress, assessing the situation. So we'll do quite a bit of data, air quality data analysis. And then we'll chase after a few regulatory um, documents to make sure they're being implemented. And then on top of that, you know, we will do, we'll collaborate with other organizations. We'll keep building our tools, probably a mobile app as well. So if anybody wants to join us, um, you're welcome to as a volunteer. Sometimes we have open job positions for specific projects too. And you do not have to be a scientist. You do not have to be a politician. You do not have to have PhD to make a difference. Everyone has to do something. You can make a difference and you can contribute. That's my farewell message. Yeah, a great farewell message. So Adstergal, thank you very much for joining us on Sideline. Thank you so much. Be safe, wear your masks.
You avoid sideline. Today we spoke to Ms. Adjaral Taktahan, founder and director of Rhythm Golia Clean Air Coalition. Thank you for watching. Goodbye.